Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Property Management Mastermind Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Larson, and today's guest, I'm bringing on Andrew Prost, and he is a past NARPM president, and we're going to have a pretty cool conversation about the state of the property management industry, along with all the cool things that Home River Group is now working on, and they have been working on for a long time. Andy served as a national president for a year, uh, served in the leadership for three, four, five years in and around that. And since he's moved on to doing these really cool acquisitions with Home River Group. And so one of the reasons I wanted to bring him on is I was telling him in the green room, I said, I want to get all the secret squirrel information about what's going on in the industry. What are you guys seeing that's out there? So we're going to get into that as we get him an introduction. So Andy, thanks for coming on. Give us a few minutes to talk, talk to us about who you are and what the Home River Group's all about. Go ahead. Yeah, man. Hey, good to see you. Uh, this is this is exciting. I've, 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 I've seen a few of the podcasts that you've done, and obviously I love what you do on Facebook uh, and the engagement there. It's it's awesome. And you are the the pioneer for all that stuff, and it's it's taken off. So it's, it's exciting to sit down with you and chat. So yeah, I mean, if you if you if you've not heard of Home River Group, we're a national third-party property management company. We're uh, focused on single-family, small multifamily rentals. <clears throat> we also do HOA management in Florida. We're tr- we're currently actually trying to expand that because you know the HOA business is so accretive, um, you know, and it's 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 very sticky and uh, it's a, it's I, I think it's a high-margin business compared to what we're seeing in property management. So I we really like that HOA business. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're in 25 markets. We just acquired uh, another national property management company just recently called uh, Property Frameworks, which was, a, which was a big acquisition for us and, and, put, and put us into uh, 12 new markets, which is pretty exciting. And then, um, you know, we're actively acquiring other companies right now. Um, we've, got a, we've got a pretty good sized pipeline of companies that we're, we're buying. And, um, you know, we're just, we're, we're just, we're just going fast. Uh, I'm just sitting here jealous because you've got a great tan and your head is nice and shiny and mine, I don't know. I, I don't have a cool light like you do, man, but. Uh, I've got lights, I've lights all over the place. And that's I, you're looking blinding. great. Yeah, yeah, you're looking great. So what I want to find out is let's go back a little bit and talk to us more about who Andy is. Kind of talk to us about sure. how you started, you know, your your role with NARPM and then your, your, your different role with HRG. Cause that's really curious because then that'll kind of tell us kind of who you are, what you are, and your role with HRG is start from the beginning and talk us through now. Yeah. So uh, when I was when I was on my I served a two year mission for uh, the LDS Church and I was on my mission. My sister called me up. You're only you're only allowed to call home twice a year on Mother's Day and Christmas. So I, I you don't get to talk to your family otherwise. You write letters. It takes a month to get a reply. So on Mother's Day, this was like. A, seven or eight months before I came home from my mission, my, my sister called me up. I talked to my mom and I talked to my sister. She said, hey, I got this management job. Uh, she was going to Portland State at the time. She's like, I get to stay there on site, live there on site for free. And all I got to do is just like collect the rent. It doesn't take that much. And so I'm thinking, uh, this is a great idea. When I get back from my mission, I'm going to get a property management job and not have to pay the rent. So I got back home and I immediately started going out trying to find property manager job, on-site property manager jobs, right? And nobody would hire me because they said, well, we're looking for couples. We need somebody to do the maintenance and we need somebody to do the management part. You would be great for the maintenance, but you need to have, a, you need to get a wife. And so I said, great. And so I quickly got married and quickly got a property management job, fixed that problem. So that was back in 1999. Uh, and for, for six or seven years, I managed properties on site, grew a, pro- a small property management business in Portland, Oregon, uh, and then tried to do everything I could to get out of property management because I hate it. I hated it. And then um, in 2007, we adopted our first child, Sam. And I said, either I need to get on, you know, because I tried all these other things, you know, navigating my way through life, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I said, either I need to get out of this business or I need to be the best I can be at it, you know, stop sitting on the fence. And so I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give it everything I got. We moved to Boise. We started a property management company called Park Place Property Management. And 2000, uh, we started in August of 2008. And then in September, the market crashed. So good timing. And then we went from you know, zero uh, to 3,000 units in about uh, four years. So we, we, were, we were growing. And a lot, of, a lot of our growth came from new development, single family built to rent and multifamily built to rent. Um, so, and, and then 2016, I partnered my company, Park Place Property Management, with two other companies, one from Florida, one from Indianapolis, Indiana, 
and we merged our companies together and created Home River Group. And we did that through an investment banker, uh, Imperial Capital and uh, TZP, which is our private equity firm, helped us put the deal together, which has been pretty exciting. And since then, uh, we started at that point, we, we were um, probably about six or 7,000 units. And today we're pretty close to 25,000 units. So uh, it's, it's been a crazy ride, but uh, it's been exciting. And I, you know, through, through NARPM, um, this has been a, a huge, I think, I think I started my company in September, uh, August, September of 2008. I joined NARPM in um, January of, of 2009. And that just, you know, you just learn, as, as, as everybody knows, when you get to join NARPM, you just like, it's a fire hose for the first year or so trying to learn all the stuff. And I had a lot of multifamily experience, you know, I had my CPM and everything, everything else. But uh, once, once, once I got into NARPM, I figured out how to do the single family side. And um, it's been, a, it's just been a great re reoccurring revenue business. Um, the people in the industry, as you know, they're just great people and they share. And it's, you know, I think, I think I've picked a really good career path when I said, look, I'm going to give this everything I got. And, um, you know, that, that's been, that's been a good, that's been a great thing for me. It's pretty impressive to see the three companies come together like that and merge because a lot of challenges I can imagine you have legal challenges, you have oh, different yeah. market challenges, and then you have also, you have a lot of cook in the kitchen challenges, right? You have a lot of, <laughs> oh, yeah. you, you know what I mean? So you have a lot of oh, folks yeah. that, that have, have high level egos and they're, you know, I want to be in charge and know you're going to take a backseat to me and all that stuff you had to work through, which sounds like you have done. Which leads me into the next question. So tell me about your role now with Home River and kind of what you've been focusing on. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. Let me just go back. I mean, when we first we first took those three companies together, you know, we, we had, uh, you know, one of our divisions was in Florida. I was in Boise and uh, my initial partners, which, which I didn't really know that well, because I was contacted by the private equity saying, hey, we got they, they were contacted by a group of guys that wanted to go out and buy a bunch of single family rentals, you know early, early on before the invitation homes and all that stuff. So they were kind of cutting edge there. And the private equity firm said, no, we're not interested in any of that stuff, but we are really interested in the service sector of real estate management. And so they quickly said, okay, well, we see the money. So let's, we'll go, we'll go chase that. So they found a company through a business broker. And then they had another guy up in Indy, who's one of my best buddies in the world, Doug Dell. And then they, they found me through uh, Peter, Peter, um, Peter Shu at Showmojo said, hey, if you want to talk to a guy that knows all the people in property, man, you got to talk to this Andy guy. So they called me up and immediately they came out and said, we want to buy your business. And I was just like overwhelmed. I'm like, hold, hold the show. And then anyway, a couple months later, we put the deal together and immediately, like you said, it's a, it's a, this is how we do it here versus how, how we do it there. And so we kind of had that rocky foundation. We're fighting over which softwares to use and how to, how to, you know, do, do everything. And the, the funny thing, it was just, it's just like politics, right? We, we basically, um, we agree on like 98%, but we focus on the 2% that we don't, we don't agree on. And we just hash that out. So um, it was that the, the initial kickoff of Home River Group was a struggle to say the least. I mean, I didn't have any hair when I started, but I, I would have definitely lost it all. But over, over time, you know, we all kind of got on the same page but I mean, still, every time we acquire a company, you know, we try to take everything we can that's great from what they do and, and, and apply it to the company. But as you know, this business is so fragmented and it's done so differently from market to market. It's just like, you can't just say, here's how you do it. And we do it like this in every market. It just doesn't work. I mean, the regulations are different. So you, you, you want to systematize the heck out of it, but the, uh, the environment doesn't allow you to. And that's Look, if, if property management would have been easy to roll up into a one national company, it would have been done by now, right? So, you know, I, we're one of the pioneers. And if you think about Lewis and Clark crossing the plains and going all the way to, you know, the, the Oregon coast, that was a lot difficult. That was a lot harder to do a couple hundred years ago. Now you can get on a plane and do it in six hours, right? So it's, you know, we're on, we're on the tough slog right now trying to make that happen. Uh, but every day it gets a little easier with technology. So. Um, I can't even remember what your question was, but no, 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 no. the fragmentation part is a fun thing to go down because, yeah. you know, that that's a blessing and a curse for our industry. It's a blessing because Absolutely. it does provide the, the mom and pops or the, or the individually owned companies, a little bit of insulation from conglomerates just taking over because it's so fragmented. So there's, there's a blessing there 
but yet it's a curse because we're all doing different things. We're all doing things our way versus the right way, and our way may not be the right way. And I look at this in several parallels. If you look at this into the dental industry, for example, right? They, you know, I, I say this is kind of a weird discussion point in this, this conversation, but sure. we've got several dentist friends and they've been rolling up like crazy. Yeah. You know, they, they've been, you know, taking, buying into these larger entities. And so now when they go to buy rubber gloves, instead of spending 10 cents a rubber glove, they spend one cent a rubber glove. You know, and it creates all these economies of scale of purchasing. And then they also uh, tuck into each other's HR resources and they tuck sure. into each other's uh, purchasing power and then operational power and training. And so the, the dental industry has seen a pretty easy massive thing. Consolidation. To, massive consolidation is a good way to say it. And I've got several friends that have gotten into that. And, you know, I, I hear from them what's going on. I'm like, wow, that would be really interesting to, to see that happen into the property management world. But, you know, the laws of dentistry in Texas are no different than the laws of dentistry in Boise, for example, or in, in yeah. Idaho. I mean, you might have different laws, but you know that the, the concepts are sure. the same. The laws of doing management in Texas may be way different than the management ideas in Idaho, for example. Sure. So that creates a little bit of a flux or a little bit of fragmentation to the point where it does create an opportunity to all keep our own little individual stripes in our markets. Now, I do want to talk about your role with HRG because uh, that's a fun conversation. We start talking about what you're doing, and this can be a whole other podcast. It can be a whole other mini series of right. fun stuff that you've seen and what you're doing. So tell us more. Yeah. So I mean, it's my my role with HRG. Obviously, as we grow, it evolves. You know, uh, it, it, we we started out with maybe um, a couple hundred, hundred, hundred and fifty people. Now we have almost five hundred full time employees. That's just crazy to think about in a property management company. Uh, I think we started. We started Park Place with uh, six full-time employees. So I mean, you know, it's it's definitely grown. So I I have I have key focuses, right? We we just hired back in March. We hired a great CFO. He's C, he's former CFO of Realogy, which is obviously a large national franchise of of real estate companies, um, and he and he's been great. So he's taken some of that CFO type role uh, off off of off of me. I also have a partner in the business, John Hirschfeld. He's our our chairman and president. So, uh, you know, he's, he's, the, he's the big boss. Uh, he's a mentor to me and a great friend. He's, he's based in New York. So I, I, my, my, my main focus is acquisitions, right? So I find other companies to, to buy, uh, add ancillary revenue. I'm, I'm focusing on growing a multifamily vertical, which is it's just really taking off right now. Um, and then uh, growing the HOA side of the business. So, and then, and then I, I kind of, you know, help there when I need, when I needed help there when I needed and spend a lot of time vetting vendors, you know, just talk, talking to, you know, whoever, whoever needs help, uh, you know, making introductions as, as no matter how big our business gets, it's still 100% a relationship business. And, you know, we're, we're, we're successful by hopefully building a solid system and finding great people to go out there and build that business through, you know, quality relationships. So that's kind of, that's kind of my day to day uh, in, in, in home river group. And it's, it's, it's busy cause there's a lot of stuff to do, but I've also got a really good team and support around me to, to help me manage all those kind of balls in the air. So everyone's going to have questions about the acquisition side, uh, you know, how you guys are growing, you're, you're buying companies. What well, everyone's got questions about that. Sure. We'll get to that, but I want to talk about kind of what you're seeing on the national level because you guys are national players and you really have your antennas up at all times, looking around you, what's sure. going on. Tell us what you're seeing with potential new trends or any sort of forecast for the property management industry as a whole. What are you seeing so far? Yeah, I mean, you know, I I, I don't I don't know if I'm going to have anything here that's going to be earth shattering because again, we we are in multiple markets and we see we're tracking you know uh, rents, delinquencies, um, any application, uh, you know, traffic, anything you can think of, anything that you can put in a system, we can track it. We can run that report. So I mean. When obviously we had a we 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 got a little nervous initially in uh, the COVID outbreak, but we saw quickly that hey, generally across the country, people were paying uh, the rent and paying it on time. In fact, we saw in some markets delinquency even went down, which is just incredible to think about. So uh, we're seeing obviously delinquencies normal to even lower. Uh, we're seeing rents uh, increase just generally across the board. 
Um, you know, the, the, big, the biggest threat right now to our industry, I think, is the real estate, the, 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 the real estate market and how hot that is. And those investors are saying, look, I can, I can sell this asset today uh, and make more money in one day than I'll make in the next 20 years on a, you know, on a, in a cash flow standpoint. So it's like once they start running those numbers, they're, they're getting out of there. Uh, we are seeing we are seeing a little bit of a new uh, a new trend a new investor trend that's coming in with uh, the roof stock one product where people can come in and buy fractions right of a single family home versus you know outlaying a hundred two hundred thousand dollars down to buy a single family rental so uh, you know that we're seeing that but just an incredible amount of investor demand to get into markets and buy property but just very little inventory to buy you know that's 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 the issue. So a lot of these institutional guys, because they can't find multifamily property to, and they've, they've I, I heard I was at um, multifamily executive conference last year, I think, yeah, or NMHC. I don't remember which one, but some guy, some guy was up there talking, he was a financial analyst, uh, economist or something. And he was saying, hey, there's $2 trillion of dry powder on the sideline waiting for wanting to get into the multifamily business. And so they can't, those those syndicators, REITs, whatever, they're trying to deploy that money. And the second they see a deal, they're obviously all over it. And people are just crawling all over the place to find deals. Um, so I, I I don't see the industry going dropping off. I mean, everybody's saying there's a bubble. There's going to be a big bubble. The second I start to see prices go down, which I'm, I haven't, immediately this dry powder is going to come into the market and keep pushing the prices back up. So I still think there's going to be tons of investor demand. I think we're going to see a lot more institutional money keep coming into the space because if you look at the American Homes for Rents, right, and uh, Invitation Homes, Progress, whatever, they they their 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 REITs are doing really well. They're 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 performing well, and so they're going to continue to raise money and continue to to deploy it. Uh, it's not going to be a big chunk of the ownership total, but that. Because they're they're proving out their their model and it's successful for them, I I think it's still going to be an issue. I mean, they're still buying up portfolios of single family homes, um, and there's a lot of build to rent type of communities out there. So, a lot of a lot of our a lot of our focus is to find, you know, good product that would that we can get in front of a builder, have that property built, and then then we then we help lease it up and manage it. That's the way to grow. For us, we like we like that opportunity because. When you take over another property that's been underperforming, uh, you know, you get an owner that's got a kind of bad taste in the mouth, whatever. It's hard to turn that situation around where when you get a brand new shiny product, you can put some put somebody in there at market rent and the owner thinks you're great. And it's a lot easier project to man, product to manage when you've got it from the start, in my opinion. So uh, those new build to rent opportunities, either single family or, or, or multifamily are really kind of uh, helping our organic growth. But we struggle just like all the mom and pops out there, right? That are saying, man, we used to we used to manage X amount of single family homes. Now we manage Y amount of single family homes because the market's just taken a lot of that of, of that business away uh, to retail to, to retail buyers. So that's that's kind of you know those are those are the kind of easy ones off the top of my head. But do you have any other specific no. questions about the national no, that's market? Great. I could listen to that stuff all day long because you yeah. dropped a, a lot of cool knowledge. It's really fun to hear. Um, you know, it makes us all kind of wonder how we can grab a piece of that pie, but it might be almost a bridge too far where, you know, you really can't. And so the frustrating part is like, as you mentioned, is investors that want to buy that there's just not a lot of product out there to purchase. And if they do see it, it's going to be overshadowed by the retail pricing and the sellers wanting to get max dollars. So they're going to put it on the open market, which means you have residential primary home buyers that want to live in that structure they're overpaying for it. They're competing with it. You're seeing multiple, you know, offers on a single property almost all the time in any sort of, uh, you know, reasonable price range. And so it is creating a, a challenge. And so we don't know if there's ever going to be a, a downturn ever again. I mean, you know, they've always been saying the interest rates are going to go up. The interest rates are going to go up. And well, we haven't seen that in 15 years, you yeah. know, 12 years, you know, however long it's been, we just haven't seen that. And they keep talking about it. They keep talking about this, you know, bubble we're in. And we just don't know yet. So it's just an interesting time. So all you can really do is, is create that system to where you're ready to jump on stuff as they potentially, uh, you know, as, as the market potentially might turn. 
But for then, you know, just we see it on the, all the time on the Facebook page. You get folks that were just like you said, X to Y. You know, they were 800 homes a year ago, and now they're 650 homes. Or you know, you do the math, the numbers in your head of how you want them. And that's concerning to a lot sure. of us. Sure. And you know, we're challenged with that as well at, at our market is we're constantly striving to do better business development to create basically replace the losses that we're taking. And so we're also taking great drives to instead of selling the homes on the open market that we want to sell, we're doing everything we can to sell those homes to investors so we don't lose the home out of our inventory. Yeah. And so that that's sort of like a, a stop loss to try and make sure your, your numbers aren't dwindling down even further. So let me ask you a big question that's just is super, super hot in everybody's mind. You know, what's going on with Zillow? What do we do? I mean, every the big Zillow question, right? It's like the elephant in the room. All of a sudden, they just kicked in the door and said, hey, we're here. Yeah. Uh, they, they stopped syndicating through multiple listing services. Uh, you have to pay for their syndication now. Yeah. Now they just acquired Showtime, which is the centralized showing service. I saw and that. So, that was like yes. I just happened yesterday. Then their yesterday. stock went. It went up twenty percent last week. It went twenty twenty percent more this week. Yeah. So all of us are looking at this like, whoa, are they going to take over the world? So what what are you guys seeing from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously I can see. I, I was just honestly just talking about uh, this with my CFO. I mean, I, I obviously they have the technology and resources way beyond anything that we have. If we probably combined everybody's resources together. Um, so it's, it's incredible. I mean, obviously their technology play is, I mean, that's, that's what, that's what, that's what happens is you have, you know, service providers, whether that service provider is a real estate agent, property manager, inspector, any, you know, mortgage lender, and you kind of have the traditional way of doing it. These guys have figured out how to come in and say, Hey, we can offer that same service, but, uh, kind of cut, cut out the middleman and then offer it in technology. Um, and they've spent a lot of time and energy to, to make that offering. And, uh, I, did you did you by chance watch Saturday Night Live? Uh, on uh, Saturday? No. Oh my gosh! If you guys get a, if you guys get a second, um, they they talk about uh, you know from from anyway it's 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 a uh, sexual topic. But the the new the new uh, the new sexual sensation for thirty to forty year olds is Zillow. Is basically it's like it, it was hilarious. So Google Zillow Saturday Night Live. Uh, but basically, you have all these 30 to 40 year olds that just spend all day swiping on Zillow. I mean, it's it's like, you know, for, for 20 to 30, you're swiping on Match.com. And when you're 30 to 40, you're swiping on Zillow. But uh, I, thought, <laughs> I, I thought I thought it was hilarious. So, I mean, they're they're in everybody's they're in everybody's like, uh, you know, periphery. So everybody knows who they are. Um, they have they have the resources to do whatever they want. So it's it's to me with Zillow. Um, Anything real estate service related, it's not a matter of uh, if, but when, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. But the thing, the thing that we have that is that kind of protects our industry is the fragmentation that we talked about earlier, right? So mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things that we have to do on the ground. Uh, there's a lot of laws that we have to follow, and you, you, you know, there's there's other companies out there, right? Uh, so Rentvine, right? They have a they have an offering. They're 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 going to have an offering for do-it-yourself managers, just like this new property company uh, management or property software company called Rent Ready. I don't know if you've heard about those guys, but it's a simple app. You can do everything, all the, all the technology sides that a prop, property manager has for nine bucks a month on an app, right? Rent Ready, R E N T R E D I dot com. If you go on bigger pockets right now, uh, they have a huge spend to try to put guys like you and me out of business with technology. So um, I think I think there's a there's a threat there. But again, I think the the bigger threat right now is uh, to us is is just the booming real estate market. I would be I would be much more afraid right now if I was a real estate agent, right, um, and and wanting to get uh, single family referrals, and I I relied on the internet to, to, to generate a lot of those referrals for me, uh, instead of having a network of people that are referring business to me, I would be worried about what Zillow is going to do. And I know the National Association of Realtors has done a lot to try to kind of keep Zillow at bay, but I, I, I think Zillow is such a powerhouse now that, like I said, it's a matter of if, not or when, not if. Yeah, it's interesting that the Realtor Association, the Realtor community, they're all having kittens right now over Zillow. Oh, yeah. And they're just, they're just fit to be tied because 
they all kind of see the threat. And if we go strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, threat, the flop technique, and we look at the threats of Zillow, uh, there, there are some real indications that the real estate community, as far as doing home sales, they are just, you know, they're, they're freaking out about this whole thing. Now, in a little bit of a parallel for us on the Zillow side, there's everyone talking about, do I pay for the lead, you know, syndications? Do I not pay? Do I not, do I pay the, the, the extortion fee of what Zillow is going to charge us? Sure. And so our take, our spin, this is that rent works in San Antonio, just our distinct market is we decided to go ahead and pay for the Zillow opportunity of syndications. And there was a, a brief time just a week or two ago where it was broken. You know, the San Antonio Board of Realtors couldn't figure out the feed, the Zillow, and our lead just fell off the absolute cliff. And then all of a sudden they turned it back on and fixed it. And our leads like just went through the yeah. roof. And so it's just kind of proof in the pudding that it's going to show you that, okay, if you want to be the one on the sideline that says, I'm not going to pay for Zillow, never, 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 ever. Okay, well, we're using it as a point of difference in our market where we can go to our owners and say, we've sucked up the extra expense and we are paying for the Zillow syndication to better advertise your home to rent it faster. Mm -hmm. And so it's a value proposition that we're doing that others may not. So if, if you're out there beating your chest saying, I'm never going to pay Zillow their extortion fee, I'd say cool for you because that's a great point of difference for us as a competitor that we are going to pay that. And sadly, it's going to be transferred into other leasing fees or other fees in the management side, just like any other fee. If we get taxed, well, we're not eating that tax. We're going to basically push that down to the consumer. That's with anything, right? That's yeah. with gasoline, that's with milk. Anytime there's an additional cost, expense, tax put on top of a, of a product or a service, it's just going to get transferred to the consumer. And that's the end result of that. But I want to kind of fill you in there. Yeah, just, I mean, you're talking high level stuff, and I want to bring it down to the tactical side. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a, I have a, a good friend that's an agent here. He's one of the best, best agents, the highest producing agents in in the state. He pays, he pays uh, to be the Zillow premier agent. He's fifty thousand dollars a month, and he pays that because it's worth it. I mean, because Zillow is producing that much activity for him. As far as people, like I said, those thirty to forty year olds that just that used to be on Match.com are now sliding through Zillow. Uh, like I, I get, I get an email or a text message from my wife every four or five hours saying, Hey, look at this, look at this, look at this house. You know, and it's all from Zillow. I'm like, go to, go to the home river group website and find that house. Stop looking on Zillow. Well, Zillow's so easy. You know, it's like, Oh my gosh, it, it is, it's, it's definitely a threat to the real estate industry. I don't know how big of a threat it's going to be to property management. I don't know if, I don't know if what we do is, is sexy enough for Zillow, but, um, because yeah, Zillow. If you're listening, what we do is not sexy at all. You don't want anything to do with it. Well, I think that's going to be a kind of shown with the you know you mentioned the rent ready source and people think they can manage the properties from their phone and there's always going to be need for our services. In my opinion, they'll never be able to fully just put it onto an app and then deal with an unruly tenant. Okay, sure. it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Or deal with a repair issue, uh, or deal with an application issue. Uh, it just there's just a lot going on in our industry that kind of insulates it. But I wanted to talk about the opportunities, you know, the strengths, weaknesses, the opportunity, threat of Zillow. And there are opportunities there. And that could sure. be just like that. You you could beef up your leads and start getting leads for purchasing property, you know, being buyer's agencies. Uh, you could also get that into leasing leads, working with tenants, and begin to create a point of difference. So there is an opportunity there. As much as we hate paying for it, I guess it is what it is. I mean, it's just a, a rotten deal that we have to go down that path. But, you know, that's it, I really like that conversation about the real estate community because, uh, you know, for years we've been saying that uh, you know, there, we've been seeing commission, uh, uh, what do you call it? Commission compression, yeah. right? We've been seeing math term come around to where, you know, it used to be X and now it's getting smaller and it's really getting smaller. And then you go to a different market, you fly in somewhere and you see, I list your home for free or, you know, I pay you $8 billion to list your home. It's just like, it's getting crazy out there with what agents are having to do to yeah. generate business. Just like you mentioned where your gentleman friend says he's paying for, you know, five figures a month to Zillow to get those those leads and it's worth it to him. So you got to figure what kind of revenue is he generating from that per month if he can fork over that amount. Sure. And so obviously it must be worth it. That's really fascinating stuff. All right, let's transition a little bit and talk acquisitions. So you're probably one of the, the 
the best people in the nation to talk with about doing acquisitions because you've been doing them for a while and you've been doing them, I would guess, numerous a year. So you've gotten really darn good. There's only a few players that I could name that have, have lots of practical experience in doing acquisitions versus, uh, you know, we all think we are experts in doing these because we heard about it on a podcast, right? But you're doing it. So the challenges are first, you have deal flow, you know, and then you're having to get a lot of frogs to get to that one deal. So, you know, kick it off with me for a little bit, just to kind of talk through some of the acquisitions and we'll bounce some questions off each other. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, look, I, it's, it's, it's not a bad business to acquire. Um, you know, we're, we're actively trying to acquire HOA management companies and we are failing miserably at it because that the, the there's a lot of national players, right, in HOA, and they they have they have gone around and they have hit everybody up a hundred times over. And so, if those people were willing to sell, they probably would have sold. So we're 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 spending a lot of money trying to find you know HOA sellers, and we're not finding a lot of luck. We find we we find folks that do property management that also have HOA, and they're either good at one or okay at the other, but they're not great at both. Um, so we see that a lot. And that's why we have this whole separate division that just all they do is focus on HOA. Um, but, you know, that business is, like I said, it's, it's a very accretive business. It's sticky. So, you know, once typically, if we do a good job, once we sign up with a, a community, we keep that community for life. I mean, they, you know, we just, it's, 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 it's a great business. But on the other side, uh, property management, there's not a lot of national players and they're not going around like we are trying to buy up everybody. There's a lot of local acquisitions happening, but not, not a big chunk of national acquisitions. And quite frankly, we're kind of getting to the point where we're in most of the markets that we want to be in. And so we're getting to the point where we're not looking for platform acquisitions, meaning, you know, the Steve Fosters, the, the Bob Machados, where there's somebody there that's established. They've got, they've got a business there. Now we're just looking in like in San Antonio, in your market, we're looking for companies that have 100, 200 units that we can acquire now uh, in, in markets that we're already in and established. There's still a handful of markets where we consider a platform acquisition, but that number is getting lower and lower every day with the, the other acquisitions that we have going on. So we're trying, to, we're trying to look for those portfolio, those perfect portfolios, 100 to 400 units. Um, you know, you know if, we, if there's somebody in, in, in Wyoming, for example, you know, uh, that would make a great platform acquisition, we would, we would entertain that because we're not in Wyoming. But again, we're kind of, if you go to our homeriver.com home website, you look at where we're at on the states, we're, we've, we've got most of, the, most of the states covered. We have a presence in those, in those states. So um, we're just, we're kind of switching from platform acquisitions over to, uh, you know, portfolio acquisitions. So that's- Yeah, I've heard, that's, the, term, I've heard the term tuck in, right? So you're looking yeah, tuck for the tuck in, tuck-ins. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense because, you know, on the other side of this, we've created a faction, myself and Phil Mazur, we're called the property manager broker. And so we're looking to assist property management companies in selling and or buying other property management companies. You know, it's just a straight up business brokerage type stuff, but yeah. we're only focusing on property managers. And so the other side of that is the tuck-ins, you know, in our opinion, we see that as like a huge opportunity because uh, one, I think they should be overpaid for. You know, if, if I was to acquire a company in San Antonio and I could just fold them into my operation, I'd be more than happy to overpay for them as you guys did, because you realize the economies of scale are going to create such an additional net operating income, additional bottom line profit that I would argue is going to increase your, your overall bottom line profit by five or 10 or 15 percent. You can decrease the expenses. Right. It's not you're creating more money on top, it's you're decreasing expenses. That's what you're doing. So instead, it's real simple math and everybody gets this. Instead of two people, you only need one person. And that could be for any job that you're doing in person in that market. And so you start looking at that across the board. Okay, well, I can now uh, let, I can let one person leave or if they want to retire and do something else, uh, yeah. I don't need to rehire that person. So I'd save myself a $50,000 salary. Well, imagine that over two or three or four, Imagine that over the processes, imagine that over all the expenses going out, the insurance, all the other junk that you got to spend. That's where the savings comes in. And yeah. so, and the, and the yeah. HR, I mean, just having a national centralized home, you know, home river, uh, 
human resource that, that covers all that, you know, that dots all the I's, crosses all the T's. I mean, every time I talk to a property manager, I just talked to a previous press president yesterday. She said, uh, you know, the only thing I don't like about this business is the human resources side. Uh, you know, and so, yeah, hey, we've got a guy, his name's Tom. He lives in Minneapolis. He's a human resources guru, right? And he's just made it so easy to get people hired, onboarded. All, you know, we have obviously great benefits because we have, you know, 500 employees. So we can, we can, we can negotiate great health insurance, great visual, uh, you know, dental, dental uh, 401ks. And that's when you start looking at um, a lot of mom and pops that, 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 that don't offer that. And then we acquire a company and we put their employees on our benefit package. They're all of a sudden like, this is the greatest thing ever. My salary is the same. And now I've got like these, you know, A plus benefits, you know, so um, it's, it's, it's generally, it's generally pretty positive from the employee standpoint when they come over and they get on our system, because it's, it's quite, it's quite frankly, a lot better than no, no benefits because a lot of these mom and pops, they're not required to offer benefits because they're under the 50, 50 uh, employee threshold. I'm going to ambush you with this question here. So yeah, any, in the acquisitions game, what are some of the lessons learned that you come across? And give me top one or two lessons learned. And it could be, you know, when you shake hands, uh, dry it off. I mean, it could be as silly as that, or it could be as big as uh, ensure that the significant other spouse is intentionally wanting to sell. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, there's there's so many. I, I think I think it's I think it's really important to so everybody knows uh, what everybody's intentions are up front. You know, like the best the best gift that we can get is a quick no or a quick yes instead of a long no or a long yes. Because our cost to acquire a company, because you know we have we have uh, we have we have to deal with the private equity company who's funding these deals, right? So they they're very diligent. They want to make sure every I is dotted, every T is crossed, and they spend a lot of money on attorneys to make sure everything is everything is perfect to protect to protect both sides, right? So everything's clear. So uh, the last thing that we want to do is get into somebody, you know, get into a, a deal with somebody that is uh, you know just kind of kicking tires. You know, so uh, we just tr just try to get everything clear up front. Typically, we do that through an LOI. And, um, you know, I would caution everybody that if, if, if somebody comes to you and wants to buy your company and they write it on the back of a napkin, the LOI, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, to be determines in there. So try to get those out early. You know, we, we obviously because we've done this a few times, we, we have a process we've learned, you know, what are those sticking points? Let's get let's get let's get across those hurdles early. So we're not two or three months into this and then the deal blows up and then, you know, we're all each side's out, uh, you know, a few grand on attorney fees. So just just being being clear, upfront, honest, overly transparent of here's here's how the process is going to go. A, B, C, you know, who's this is who does this. This is who does that. And then everybody kind of feels, um, you know, relaxed. The other, the other thing, you know, going through going through the process is just uh, setting up a system of constant communication with the seller. Because if, if you sit, if, if a, a sellers decide to sell and, and you don't talk to them almost every day, they, they're they thinking what's happened, right? What's going on? Is this deal gonna, and then and then they're, they, they think, you know, there's something going on. And it's maybe just cause, hey, we're busy. We're doing something else. You know, uh, the, the seller gets into uh, deal mode, what I call deal mode guy, right? Once you once you once you decide you want to do a deal, you'll almost do everything you can to make that deal happen, and that's a constant reoccurring thought in their mind: is what do, what do I need to do to get this deal done? What, and if they're not hearing from us on a regular basis, uh, their deal mode guy just goes crazy in their head, and uh, they might get like cold feet, right? So that's that's a big one, uh, you know. And, and then I've I've talked about this in a, at a NARPM event, you know. If you're and I think this is a problem in in, in um, if you're if in, in Texas, if you're a seller, it really benefits you to have your property management agreements assignable, you know. So we, we if we, we buy companies that have assignable contracts and we buy companies that don't have assignable contracts, and quite frankly, it's better for us as the buyer to get contracts that aren't assignable. They have to come on to our PMAs. It's more work up front, but they're on our PMAs, they're gonna do it our way, which is great. But it's better for the seller if they have an assignable contract because you're just like here you go here they are take them as they are, and 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 it's not it's not as it's not a clean slate start start with a with a new uh, term of the agreement or whatever. So 
make sure if you're a seller in the future, make sure those contracts are assignable. It's, it's only going to help you. It might not help the buyer, but it's going to help you as a seller. Do you guys typically use a boilerplate design of a deal or is it really individual to that particular seller? I would say probably in our agreements, I would say 75% of what's in there is a boilerplate, you know, from the same attorney that we had that drafted my, my buy, buy, my buy, sell agreement. We're using a lot of that language. Um, you know, obviously if it's a portfolio or what you call a tuck in acquisition, then it's probably a little bit shorter. We're really trying to optimize that tuck in deal. So if somebody contacts us in 30 days, they could be cashed out. They're done, you know, like, you know, but if it's a platform acquisition, it's probably going to be more of a 60 to 90 day where we're buying, you know, the business, all the assets, not just the property management agreements. So, um, you know, and, and look, I mean, it, I think it's a good time to go out and buy other property management companies right now, because there's a lot of folks in the business that are kind of hitting that retirement age. They've just gone through this whole COVID crisis. And they're like thinking, just like I'm sure you had, like, what's the point, what's the point of doing all this, you know? Right. So I get, I get a lot of those, uh, you know, I just, I just kind of lost focus and the coronavirus has kind of put things in perspective and I'm just not sure what the point of doing this anymore is. Um, so I think I'm ready to sell, you know? So I've had a lot of those type of conversations because people are just, people are just getting tired, you know, just generally people are just tired. So, um, you know, and we're trying, we're trying to find a good solution for those folks. Where are you guys taking it? Do you guys have a goal or an end game in mind? Yeah. Uh, once we buy rent works, um, goal achieved. Just kidding. Um, no, I mean, you know, obviously we've, we're, we're four years and change into the, uh, private equity play, right? So private equity and the, and the group that we have, you know, TZP, uh, they brand themselves the partners of choice. They really are like top, top of the line guys trying to do what's best for our industry, really give us the tools that we need to expand the business the way we want. Um, you know, the guy, the, the guy that I work with in, in New York, he's, 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 he's not just my private equity partner. He's, he's a really good friend. I mean, he's a movie buff. He's a movie buff. We talk about movies. He'll, he'll text me in the middle of the night. I just watch this, watch this one. You'll love it. Tell me what you think. So, you know, we're, we have a certain goal in mind to get there. Um, but you know, obviously the, the, the bigger you, the bigger your company is, the more units you manage, the higher your revenue, the more consistent your revenue the multiple of your business goes up. So if we can, if we can buy companies at a, you know, a five to seven multiple, and we can, and we can get our EBITDA up above 30 to 50 million, you know, our multiple goes from six to seven to maybe 10 or 11, right? If we can figure out how to mix in, you know, we're working on some technology in our business right now too. Um, if we can figure out some uh, proprietary technology in our business, then our multiples might go up a little more. So, uh, there's a, a, a lot of the folks that have partnered with us, partnered with us early that didn't take all cash. So when we first started this business, we would say, hey, give us 20% of your business in equity, kind of like the, um, what are the, the rent vault, the rent vault guys, they're just kind of combining their companies, right? Just everybody's just taking equity. I'm, I'm not 100% sure how they're doing that, but, um, but we did that. So 25% in equity, the rest in cash. And that obviously if, if they sold their business at a four or five or six or seven and put the, put their equity in and we sell it at 10 or 11, you know, it's going to be a great payday for them when we sell this thing in a couple of years. So, you know, ultimately it's just trying to get to that EBITDA target where we get the higher multiple. Um, and then, and then that's when we'll probably exit. Uh, and then, and then, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm only 40, right? So I hope, I hope whoever we partner with in the future, um, I'll still have a job and I can still do this because I love, I love the business. Um, and I think a lot of the people that, you know, the younger folks that have partnered with us, you know, they're going to, they're going to want to continue to stay involved. Um, cause as, as you know, it's, it's a, it's a people intense business. You've got to have people there putting the signs in the yard, putting the lock boxes on the door, showing the properties, uh, trashing out the units, doing the inspection. You know, I mean, Zillow is great. They've thought they've, they've, they've come a long ways with technology, but you still have to have people to do those key services that, uh, that we do. I want to hear your explanation. Uh, this is kind of a question that's kind of odd, but explain to the audience, explain to me the difference in your head between uh, private equity and venture capital. Yes. So hit, hit me up with how you can explain that. X, X and I mean, it's, it's a Y and Z, uh, apples and oranges. 
So pri private equity, um, you know, they're, they basically, they, they invest in a, a, a structure that, I mean, this is just, this is just my opinion. There's probably a million other opinions out there, but they're, they're investing in a, a, a service or structure that's already in place, right? They're not making a big bet that, uh, you know, a, a, a technology company is valued at $10 a day, it'll be valued a billion dollars later. But basically they take companies that, uh, you know, don't have the financial structure typically in, in place um, and, and, and come in and buy those companies and say, okay, let's, let's take a look at how you guys are running this business. Let's run a bunch of different models and how we can help you uh, grow the business. Uh, and they're not making a, a, big, a, a, a big bet on uh, a, a future opportunity. It's more of a, it's more of a guaranteed thing, right? So uh, they, they've seen a long history of, of uh, they've seen a long history of performance and they say, look, if we can get involved, we can help that performance improve with either helping them acquire more companies or helping them putting it, putting in systems in place or helping them with their financial models, right? Getting their budget, get it, getting their budget in place, overseeing the financials, et cetera. So that's what private equity does. And they'll take, they'll take a, a, low, a lower risk, but they're not gonna have this massive reward in the end where venture capital, they'll spend a lot of money betting, they'll, bet, they'll make 10 bets and lose lose on nine, but win huge on number ten, right? Um, so they'll typically get involved in younger startups, uh, risky tech businesses, and and things where they they see an opportunity to just you know put a bunch of resources into it, hope and pray until the until the money runs out, and then uh, you know find somebody that'll buy them for a, a crazy multiple, so they get their money back plus a lot more. So that's that's. It's it's true. It's truly a venture. It's a it's it's, you know, you're you're throwing your money into the wind, and hopefully you're going to get it's going to blow back. Versus private equity is is, is a, a much more a structured, uh, less risky, um, you know, moving forward. So we don't. So our our private equity. We, I couldn't call my private equity company today and say, hey, just send me, fifteen million dollars because I want to invest in this technology, right? Um, they 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 wouldn't say no, but they'd say, I need a bunch of I need. I need to, they're going to underwrite it and look at a million different things. If I was a venture ca capital company, may just invest a hundred million dollars in me. And I called them up and said, I need 15 million more because of X, Y, Z. I'd probably have the money in my bank account tomorrow. So it's a, it's a very different, very different um, uh, models. So more, more of a structured business mentality versus an entrepreneurial kind of a crazy entrepreneurial mentality. That's a great discussion. I love that talking point. I wanted to hear it in your words. And I thought that was yeah. well said. So that was really cool. So Andy, you know, I want to thank you for coming on. I look forward to seeing you at the Property Manager Mastermind Conference at the end of May. And that's Dallas. at cmcon.com in Dallas, May 20 and 21. And uh, let's all hope and uh, knock on wood that we get through this COVID stuff and have a successful, super in-person, maskless conference. And so that's going to be the line in the sand for us to, to make that decision. But yeah, we're planning it full bore that we're going to have this uh, ready to rock in May 20 and 21 at the Grapevine Resort there in Dallas. So Andy, thanks again for coming on. Great conversation as always, as expected. I look forward to seeing you in the future and appreciate you coming on again. Thank you much. Great to see you, man. Thank you.